Okay, so thank you for all for being here in person and also uh, online. So, uh, also, I would like to say some words about the, the support of Paris School of Economics. No, I prefer to be here because. Uh, so, for the support of Paris School of Economics, uh, uh, for the academic uh, research and teacher in Ukraine during this period. Uh, in the coming month, uh, I suppose we will continue to uh, the project, the project of uh, Ukrainian global university, and especially uh, tax will be, will be a bilateral cooperation with the key school of economics, and including by uh, hosting uh, researchers, students, and and also by establishing a new uh, research project, new links with uh, if, uh, School of Economics. And uh, with that, and we deeply uh, uh, hope uh, to contribute uh, to the continuity of research and teaching uh, in Ukraine during this very monumental period. So, Daniel, you have the floor for this uh, on table and presentation of speaker. Thank you, speaker, to me. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for uh, so nicely organizing this uh, this conference. So usually, I would say that I'm very happy to have this conference and to greet you all. Obviously, uh, this is a sad moment, and we should all view uh, this conference as a way of showing our tribute to to the suffering of the people in Ukraine. Um, we have uh, adopted uh, a presentation that will follow uh, the alphabetical order, except for uh, Timo Five that will speak last uh, from the Kiev School of Economics, so as to open up our discussion, and allow you to ask more questions on the situation in Ukraine and, and what is uh, going on uh, in the, in the, what, what can be done in, in the week to come. Uh, obviously, this is an economic conference at the Paris School of Economics. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian situation is not an economic uh, issue uh, at first uh, glance. It is a humanitarian uh, question, it is a military question, a geopolitical, a legalistic also issue as to whether uh, international courts uh, should be saved by what is going on. But economics <coughs> do have a lot uh, to say on. Uh, how much the, the sanction can matter, the energy issue that has been raised, the refugees uh, uh, question that is arising. On, uh, obviously, all that can be said about the long run of the, the Russian power and economy. So, in fact, once you start opening up the, the question that will be addressed by this panel, you see that it has a lot of relevance uh, to, to the issues which are discussed. So uh, let me just add, uh, you know, before I give the floor to, to Sergei, maybe each of you could introduce yourself very rapidly rather than me doing it uh, uh, one after the other. Just to say that for those who are online, uh, you can ask uh, questions that will be uh, gathered and asked to the speaker at the end. Also, we won't take questions during the presentation themselves, but you, you, immediately after you can raise your hand. Or, and we'll get into a debate with the speakers, both online and of, uh, both here and online, obviously. So without further ado, let me, let me start with uh, Sergei for the first introduction. Uh, introduce yourself very rapidly, and everyone knows you, but still, <laughs> and, and get with them. No more than 10 minutes each, because we have you know, many things to cover. But you want me to introduce myself or to speak for 10 minutes? <laughs> just, just introduce yourself for one second and speak for 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm Sergey Grip, I'm professor of economics at Science Po. Uh, I uh, actually lived in Kiev for 12 years when I was in school. Um, among other things, I also was a chief economist at the PRD, where I traveled to Kiev a lot and met with some people on the call uh, quite often. So for me, it's not just a professional, but also personal uh, matter. So um, what uh, what can we say? I think. <clears throat> We have a we have a tragic tragic event that we observed uh, uh, for the last uh, forty two days by now, and uh, this is going to have uh, major implications for Ukraine, for Europe, for the whole world, and for Russia as well. Uh, one of the things which uh, we observed was uh, a dramatic impact on Ukrainian economy, and Timothy and uh, Yuri will talk about that. 
but uh, this war has also destroyed the uh, Russian economy. As I guess, as a as a scholar of Russian economy, I can say a few words about this. Uh, so um, uh, the sanctions were quick and resolute and unified beyond any belief. And so one of the things I would mention is that uh, Russian government definitely didn't expect that unity and resolve that we observed. Uh, probably the worst that Russian government expected was switching off the Russian banking system from SWIFT, which is kind of happening almost completely by now. So today, the full blocking sanctions from the US came for the largest bank in Russia's Berman. Also, some other banks, bank number two, got the full blocking sanctions almost uh, in the second day of work, third day of work. Uh, the most important sanctions came on um, February 26, the third day of war, when uh, the US and Europe together introduced sanctions against the Russian Central Bank. But uh, by that, destroyed macroeconomic stability in Russia, uh, because one of the major pillars of Russian macroeconomic stability was the reserves uh, of $635 billion, uh, one of the largest reserves of foreign currency and gold in the world. Uh, within those reserves, there was sovereign wealth fund, Russian sovereign fund, uh, uh, which was yet another pillar of uh, macroeconomic stability. So not surprisingly, two days later, Russian Central Bank introduced capital controls, closed down stock exchange. Now stock exchange is reopened, but it works in a very constrained mode. Um, the currency exchange was closed. Now it's also reopened, and it's also working in a very constrained mode. So whoever tells you, uh, ruble has recovered. That's a mistake. It's a bit like ruble uh, in Soviet times when uh, dollar was 60 kopecks. Uh, um, so it's not really a market exchange rate. Right? So Russian financial stability is gone. Inflation has been uh, 2% per week. So there are lots of macroeconomists around, around the table who worry about uh, European inflation being two percentage points per year higher than the target. So in Russia, it was first week 2% per week, second uh, 2% per week, third week, 2% uh, per week, fourth week, it started to come down to 1% per week, and the fifth week will know the data probably today. Uh, so uh, then the problem is uh, to what extent these sanctions, which will definitely result in a recession, which is bigger than any recession since early 1990s, the mid-range estimate for GDP change in 2022 is minus 10. That comes, for example, from forecast by EBRD published a few days ago. The same is from uh, Bank of England Institute for Transition Economies, which is one of the most avid watchers of Russian economy. Uh, there are some institutions which give you a much worse number. Uh, for example, Institute for International Finance and DC gives you minus 15%. So this is a huge, huge uh, recession which is coming up. Uh, there are specific features that we still cannot uh, evaluate. So for example, uh, the biggest Russian automotive firm is uh, slowing down production because they rely on imported components which are not coming because of not just sanctions but private sector boycott. Um, uh, but planes <coughs> will stop flying soon, or at least will stop fly, flying in safe mode uh, because, um, uh, because Airbus and Boeing uh, will not service them anymore uh, because their insurers and leaseholders uh, stopped. Uh, uh, insuring and leasing them. So what's likely to happen is the Russian government just will nationalize those and uh, and uh, simply uh, simply say pretend it's safe to fly those planes without going to their bus service. And that is almost like 90% of seat capacity in Russia. So uh, I, I, I've never lived in this. I've lived in a society without smartphones, uh, which is also going to be Russian society now, uh, at least without iPhones. Uh, but uh, I've never lived in a society without planes, so I'm not sure how that is going to function. I'm, I'm sure that, again, all these problems relative to what's happening in Ukraine, where planes exist and bomb civilians, that's, of course, a different, uh, uh, a different, different uh, magnitude. But uh, still, since, uh, since uh, we decided that I talk about Russian economy, this is what I'm, I'm saying. Now, uh, is it enough to stop the war? Probably not. Uh, why? Because oil prices are high, gas prices are high. And so even though the stock of Putin's cash is destroyed, the flow is coming in every day. And that's why I'm very grateful to German economists who on the first day of war apparently decided to start crunching numbers and Moritz will talk about that. And within two weeks produced a, a very impressive piece of research evaluating the implications of uh, full oil and gas embargo. And I think this is, 
the game changer that needs to be addressed if we want Putin to run out of cash and stop the war. Because as long as as long as he keeps selling oil and gas, he keeps getting enough fiscal resources to continue continue this war. And so this is one game changer. The other game changer is China. Uh, to what extent China will be happy to substitute imports from the West? To what extent China will be happy to bail out Russian fiscal problems? To what extent China will buy more Russian oil and gas? This is anybody's guess. Of course, the war is not in Chinese interest because China is interested in prosperous and peaceful Europe. Europe is one of the major Chinese markets. And so in that sense, it is an objective Chinese economic interest to stop the war as soon as possible. On the other hand, and I guess uh, Daniel will talk about this uh, in his questions and comments, China doesn't like sanctions at all because it believes it may become next uh, target of sanctions. China is already a target of sanctions. But not not such sanctions. And so in that in that respect, uh, we don't know where China is going to uh, move. So far, Chinese banks and companies violated zero American or European sanctions. So so far, they're afraid of becoming targets of secondary sanctions. That doesn't doesn't mean that uh, they will actually actively cooperate. So uh, we are in great uncertainty. And I think um, uh, when we talk today, stopping uh, the war is all about decisions made in Europe. Um, and that is, these are decisions related to um, oil and gas embargo uh, or oil embargo and gas import tariff. This is the solution on the table. Many people around the world sign the petition on the website Stop Financing the War, which uh, includes oil embargo, 40% uh, gas tariff, and supporting low income uh, European households. So these are, these are the issues which are on the table now. Without them, with current oil prices, um, Yes, Putin probably sells less oil than before. Yes, he gets a discount. Uh, so oil, oil price is uh, more than 100, but Putin only gets 70 or 75. Again, we don't have data on this. Uh, one of the issues is that the month of March is over, but the data for exports, which were supposed to come out on April 2nd, did not come out, as the Russian government said, because of technical problems. So we don't know how much Russia has exported. But one number I'll leave you with is, Suppose we want to know what the oil price should be for Putin to break even in fiscal terms. Before the war, this number was forty-four dollars per barrel, but this number is based on plus three percent growth in 2022. That was pre-war forecast. So with minus ten, this number becomes somewhere in the range of 70, 75. So if Putin <laughs> sells all the oil and gas which he was planning before the war, and there is a discount of thirty percent, like it is now then it's fine. And in that sense, uh, oil and gas embargo is a necessity if we want to make sure that Putin doesn't have money to pay his soldiers and officers, to pay his propagandists, and to pay his policemen, which beat up anti-war protesters in Moscow and other cities in Russia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xavier. Uh, this is great. Open a really good discussion based on how on sanctions. So the second speaker is uh, Yuri from uh, UC Berkeley. Where is he? Uh, here? Yeah. So go ahead, Yuri, introduce yourself and, and try to stick to 10 minutes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm a professor of economics uh, at UC Berkeley, <clears throat> and uh, I will uh, have a, a very sad subject, which is, you know, what do we do with nuclear threats made by uh, Putin? Uh, to, to, to inflict on Europe and other countries that may interfere with, uh, uh, with his invasion in the Ukrainian uh, territory. Um, now, I will use a few slides uh, just to keep this uh, uh, topic uh, going. But before I do this, I would say, you know, I'm an economist, I'm not a military expert. And so one question may be why you should listen to me uh, rather than uh, you know some type of general or something, but I would say that economists thought you know alone and hard about um, uh, about these issues, and in fact you know game theory was one of the branches of economics that was really working on this on those questions, and so <clears throat> you know we, we have to think about these issues very seriously because uh, as I said you know Putin made threats that he may use uh, weapons of mass destruction including nuclear weapons. If uh, you know the the war goes not according to his scenario, somebody intervenes, and so we have to think about how we can deter the use of nuclear weapons 
uh, in the future or in the immediate future and think about the long-term uh, implications uh, for this, you know, threats and how we can deter Putin from using these weapons um, in, in the longer run. Now, to frame this conversation, uh, I will uh, first look at, uh, you know, the evidence or, you know, the thinking we had uh, in the standoff, uh, during the standoff between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, during the Cold War. And the setup was very simple. Uh, the rules of the games were the game where that, you know, Soviet Union knew that if it attacks uh, the US, it will be destroyed Yuri? by- uh, Yuri. Yuri, sorry to interrupt. We don't see your slides. You don't see my slides? Oh. All right. All right, so I will uh, then uh, try it again, see if it works. Huh. We did see them before. You did see them before? At the yes. beginning, uh, yes. before we started formally, yeah. Do we see it now? No. 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 All right. Well, okay, let me talk without slides. Um, okay, I have, I have your slide, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. I have your slide. Okay. Um, do you see them on, on the screen? Yes, I do. Okay, so you can ask uh, us to, to pass them. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> let's go back to the lessons we learned from the Cold War. We knew that if the Soviet Union attacks um, the US, the US will have enough capacity to destroy um, the Soviet Union in retaliation. And likewise, uh, the United States knew if the, they attack the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union has enough capacity to destroy um, the US. Next slide. And uh, <clears throat> The key element in this game was that the, everybody knew that they are sure if they move first, if they strike you know, the other country first, they're going to be destroyed. And so the key element here was that this sin is assured, right? There was a guarantee. And this guarantee took a variety of forms. One is you have the nuclear triad. So if you take out bombers, you have still ICBMs and submarines. If you take ICBMs, you have submarines. And you had so many nuclear weapons that you had you know, stockpiles enough to destroy the world many times over. And um, also the, the types of commanders that, you know, ran these operations, uh, such as Curtis LeMay, uh, LeMay, were diehards, you know, committed to execute whatever orders they're given to make sure that, you know, their revenge is, is exacted. Next slide. And, um, you know, the equilibrium in this game was very simple. Nobody wants to move first because you know, they know that if they move first, they're going to be annihilated one way or another. So um, it was a simple equilibrium, very clear equilibrium. This is what kept the Cold War cold. Next slide. Now, what we have to think now about situations where there are threats to this equilibrium. And one of the threats may be when one of the sides becomes crazy or crazier, right? Somebody is willing to take a lot of risk and threaten the other side with a nuclear war and, and we saw examples of this for example when Khrushchev put uh, nuclear missiles on Cuba it was a very dangerous escalation and uh, it looked like a very responsible move uh, but we know how to solve this uh, situations next slide please we have solutions quote-unquote solutions one is we have to escalate to de-escalate right so the uh, Kennedy administration put uh, you know uh, the strategic air force and other uh, parts of the nuclear triad uh, on high alert. And so uh, Khrushchev knew that the moment he moves, you know, he will be destroyed. And, and so this was, nobody wanted to kind of cross the line. And so you come very close to the brink, but then you de-escalate and go back to, uh, to a more uh, safe situation if you can have it in, in this standoff. Another option is to appoint another crazy person. So if you know, Khrushchev is crazy, you can have a crazy American. Obviously, it's much more dangerous because you have less control. But in this game of chicken, at some point, somebody is going to stop and realize that you know, if you have any iota of reason, you know, reason you, you, you're not going to move first. One key element here is that it has to be, unfortunately, the balance of terror. If somebody is willing to escalate, then the other side has to be willing to escalate as well. If you don't escalate, if you don't have balance, you have only terror left. It sounds horrible, but you know this is the rules of the game here. And so Putin keeps escalating. Unfortunately, the other side in this um, st potential standoff is not really willing to escalate. Everybody is very scared. 
And I think we should have a little bit more courage here and say, look, you know, if you want to do something horrible, you should know that we're going to respond with full force. Next slide, please. Another threat to the med equilibrium, again, I'm, I'm talking about all horrible scenarios. And, and so I hope none of this happens, but we have to be thinking about this. Um, and so another threat to this med equilibrium is that you, what is called salami tactics. So sometimes it's called the paradox of Narva. Narva is a very small uh, city, literally next uh, on the border to, to Russia. And so imagine a scenario, next slide, please when uh, Russian forces invade Estonia and capture Narva. Is it clear that NATO countries are going to respond uh, to this uh, invasion, this provocation with full force, use Article 5? You know, we'll see, this has never been tested. Next slide. Then we can escalate this a little more and invade Sweden or Finland, neutral countries, part of the EU, but they're not a part of NATO. Will you respond if this invasion happens? Again, not clear. It has not been tested. Next slide. Uh, what if Russia invades Poland? You know, people in America can say, well, you know, it's it's Europe. You know, why would we want to risk uh, Armageddon with Russia if if it's Poland? And and we saw this before when people in West Germany were really concerned that if Russia invades, Soviet Union invades West Germany, you know, there will be no response. The country will be taken over in a matter of days. Next slide, please. You can have even more complicated scenarios where it's not hypothetical anymore when Russian forces shell a nuclear power plant and there is a radioactive cloud covering uh, the Western Europe. What do you do with this? Is it an attack? Or if it's not an attack, what is it? Next slide. Again, <clears throat> people thought a long uh, and hard about these issues, thinking you know what we can do in response to this. And uh, one uh, doctrine formulated by uh, State Secretary Dallas was that no matter how small the attack is, you have to respond with full force. Otherwise, this you know crawling low-grade conflict can go on for a very long time. Next slide. Another uh, solution to this is to put what is called tripwire troops. So with some oversimplification, you put American troops in Narva. If you know they attacked, it's a, an attack on, on the United States, and so the United States will be more committed to respond. Um, again, it's it's a more dangerous situation because you raise the probability of a big conflict, but that's what's predicted by the game theory here. Next slide. One thing which is also clear here is that if you have this, you know, small provocations, small invasions, uh, it is optimal to avoid uh, <clears throat> saying that, well, I'm not going to do X if you do uh, Y, right? So if you invade Narva, we're not going to respond with full force. And one way to think about this is, suppose you, you have a house and you have fence and you're right on the fence saying, well, you know, if you try to climb into my window to rob my house, I'm not going to call the police. Is it going to increase the probability of, you know, uh, burglary? Obviously not. It, it's going to increase it. And so in these situations, you should avoid saying that you will not call the police. You are not going to use the full force to stop the aggression. Next slide, please. Now, another thing we should be thinking about is, you know, if uh, country A uses conventional forces to attack country B, next slide. And we have to ask these questions because we see this is happening in Ukraine. Uh, Russia is not using nuclear forces to uh, uh, attack Ukraine. It's tanks, guns, artillery. Uh, you know, where do you cross the line? Um, it's, it's related to the previous uh, slide when I was talking about the salami tactics. You know, what is big enough to uh, respond with full force? Next slide. And the answer to this is that you can't rely only on nuclear weapons because, uh, you know, if hypothetically Putin invades another country with tanks, uh, he may think that it will be a bluff that, say, France or UK or, or, or the United States will use nuclear weapons to stop this attack. They will probably think that uh, their response has to be with conventional um, armed forces. And so this means that we have to have a very strong army uh, and don't rely just on nuclear forces. Next slide, please. Now, this is kind of the short run stuff. You know, what we should do also is to think about how we can address these issues in the long run. And again, we're not going to invent the wheel here. We have a lot of lessons from history. Next slide, please. One is uh, coming from the Lone Telegram um, many years ago, uh, where the main idea, well, if you can't attack a big country, 
you have to contain it. You have to deny, deny economic resources so that this country cannot afford um, this expensive toy called nuclear weapons or a big army. And we already see something like this happening. We see all sorts of restrictions on the Russian economy, embargoes. So we're kind of working in, in this direction. And it's, it's a good thing. But as, as Sergei said earlier, we probably need to do a lot more to really tighten the screw on sanctions and make the, the war unaffordable. Next slide, please. Uh, we know that containment is costly. The Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, but you can uh, accelerate this process by uh, doing armed uh, arms race. Again, this is not an ideal scenario. Instead of spending money on the army, nuclear weapons, Navy, and so on, uh, you should be spending this money on schools, healthcare, infrastructure, and so on. But if you have this strategic threat, then uh, the idea is that you can outspend your opponent. And we saw this during the Cold War. The Carter Reagan administration had a huge military buildup. U.S. is already spending a lot more than any other country in the world. In fact, you know, it's very close to all other countries combined. Uh, but the size of the army we have in the US now is, is, is only a fraction of what it used to be at the heyday of the Cold War. And the US used to spend you know, many more dollars in the 80s on, on the armed forces, uh, forces than it is spending now. You can basically double military spending and the US economy is still going to be able to finance it. And the last slide is, uh, you can think about you know, less standard solutions to this. You can develop new technologies, which will make nuclear weapons or ICBMs uh, less threatening. Um, there was an idea in the Reagan administration to create Star Wars Strategic Defense uh, Initiative. It didn't materialize, but probably the technology now is so much more advanced that in theory, you can probably develop something that can at least minimize to the extent it's possible in nuclear war, the size of destruction. So again, Russia does not have technological capacity to do it. Uh, the West has technological capacity to do it. All of the scenarios, as I said, are very terrible, uh, but we have to be thinking about this because it's a major security issue and um, we have to do something about this. We have to take more courage and start to you know contain russia in many ways and you know maybe i would spend them thank you okay thank you thank you so much you're uh, all scared to death now but uh, <laughs> yeah. great presentation and uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that so the next speaker is massimo he's, he's online too where are you yeah massimo if you can introduce yourself and please uh, keep track of the time because it's more difficult for me to moderate you uh, at a distance, so try to self-impose uh, the 10 minutes uh, you know, presentation. But do introduce yourself very rapidly, and we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. Uh, my um, apologies for um, bringing to the table a, an issue that will be um, perhaps seem a bit nerdy uh, at the beginning, but my goal is to uh, show you what uh, some uh, research in, um, in progress that I have with uh, co-authors in Lausanne uh, on, on this type of topics that we started uh, way before this, uh, this crisis. Uh, how does this research um, uh, it, uh, perhaps um, uh, enlighten us a little bit on the motivations of this war and how this uh, uh, insights, these insights on the motivations of this war can actually um, change perhaps our views on uh, or confirm uh, some, some of our views on what policies work and what policies do not work. In particular, uh, what I'm going to try to argue in these 10 minutes is that um, first of all, based on our studies on gas trades, gas traded volumes, gas infrastructures, all on gas, uh, as I'll argue in a second, um, the, it is not possible, uh, it is not rational to think that uh, the war uh, started by Russia with Ukraine could increase uh, any um, economic prospect for Russia. So the economic motivations are off the table. And moreover, even the motivations in terms of domestic politics, uh, regime stability, power holding, 
uh, can be put to a very, very serious doubt. And therefore, either they were not the right, the, the, the real motivation of Putin in this war, or if they were, or one of them, then they were mi seriously miscalculated. And both, uh, you know, understanding better what the motivations were, and even in the case in which they were one of these, but they were miscalculated, in both cases, I, I'm going to argue, the analysis I'm going to uh, try to uh, describe to you quickly has an implication, namely that, for example, the, the, the tough uh, embargo and types of policies that Sergei mentioned, that economists uh, also in Germany now agree with, but politicians are still reluctant to, to put forward, is not only going to be effective uh, uh, economically, but could also have unexpected domestic politics con con uh, consequences. So let me begin by saying, what, what do we do in this uh, on, uh, work in progress that we have? Namely, so we have studied, as I said, all the, uh, all the gas pipeline network constructions and traded volumes and prices uh, since the um, end of the Cold War till now. And uh, we have um, decided to study the effects of increases, uh, changes in between a centrality, which is a, a measure of global centrality of a node, of a country, right? So obviously, even a country like Ukraine uh, uh, used to be quite central. Then, of course, this, uh, this uh, global centrality, for example, got reduced by the formation of the link between Georgia and Turkey in 2007, or by the formation of Nord Stream 1, because, of course, uh, the, the, the number of shortest paths that go through Ukraine to the, to the, to the final consumers went down. Okay, so there, there could be a long discussion about uh, uh, effects of these reductions in, in BC in between the centrality on various uh, uh, variables of interest. And what we, what we do is say, well, in order to causally identify the effects of this global centrality changes on the, the dependent variables of interest that I'm going to tell you in a minute, uh, we control for uh, local centrality or for degree centrality, because that could be endogenous, right? So, so controlling for that, and this is the nerdy part that maybe, you know, with, with tables and so on, I could convince you of this identification strategy. We don't have time, but believe me, there is some good, good uh, argument, we believe, that this is causally identified. And, that's, and therefore, in, the, in what follows, I'm going to say that changes in between a centrality cause some important changes in what? Well, what uh, uh, what happened in, in history in our in our data is that uh, whenever between a centrality changed, that uh, basically caused a reduction of democracy inside the country. Uh, and even more strongly and more robustly, what we show is that the changes, the positive changes in centrality, have increased increased regime durability. Now, I will tell you about the third result later, but look at this, think about these two things, democracy down, regime durability up, in all possible measures, all possible data sets. What this means is that while uh, uh, adding Nord Stream 2 and, and remaining peaceful and open trade and, and, and maintaining the dependence of Europe, on Rus uh, of Europe from Russia, et cetera, uh, would have, according to the data, maintained uh, regime stability and keep uh, democracy at bay for Putin, actually going to a war and given the uh, medium round consequences this will have on uh, change, strategic changes by all buyers to, to buy gas from others or invest in other things, etc., the, the BC, the between the centrality of Russia is likely to go down. So regardless of what happens to the war, I'm saying that the data show that uh, if, if you believe that if you believe this causal identification I'm just mentioning quickly, th this shows that the, you know the outcomes will be a reduction in centrality, which means actually lowering uh, regime durability, lowering uh, domestic uh, stability, increasing political competition, increasing the actual tendencies towards Western democratization that, according to some scholars, uh, are the main fear of Putin. So either these were not the motivations, and therefore one can think about the existential threat posed by NATO that Mirsheimer or Kissinger talk about, or else maybe they were one of these, but subject to serious miscalculations. 
Okay. Now, the third thing that we show is that in all this period, whenever a country started, initiated a militarized interstate dispute, uh, and, and bo both looking at the di direct uh, uh, initiations and cases in which there was an involvement, but not necessarily good data about in initiation, the willingness to sanction by the countries that are dependent on a central node, on a central country, so in this case, Europe, very dependent on Russia, uh, have historically been, been uh, uh, very low. What does this mean? This means that in, in the expectations of Putin, the, even though, as I said, the, the war itself cannot, be, uh, cannot have as an objective an, an economic one, but in terms of the economic costs of the whole sanctions and so on, probably he underestimated the, the, the um, uh, effectiveness and the ability of Europe, as, as, as Sergei pointed out, to sanction effectively. But as Sergei told us, the sanctions as so far made are bad for the Russian economy, but are not necessarily bad for, for Putin, not bad enough to make Putin stop the war. An embargo would do it, as also Sergei pointed out. But on top of that, look at the consequences of what I told you. An embargo, uh, because it would reduce centrality with a dramatic jump down, you would actually, in, uh, in our you know, uh, extrapolation from, from past history, create that domestic political instability uh, uh, it, that was, according to some scholars, one of the motivations of the war itself. Okay? So, so this tells you that I'm, uh, I'm, f I'm very strongly in favor of embargo today, but this doesn't mean that I'm a believer in hawkish uh, uh, behavior to cure uh, on trade, because trade and peace are typically, when trade is more symmetric, positively correlated. Therefore, I would warn against threats that, that uh, uh, made in particular by the US of pot potentially being uh, 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 maintaining sanctions forever. Protectionism has been bad uh, in many occasions. Lifting uh, sanctions and actually uh, helping even the perpetrators of, ter of terrible wars has been a recipe for peace. And we know what happened when Germany was severely punished after World War I. So, so I'm not in favor of long run uh, 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 threats and long run uh, pol uh, policies that would actually make Russia in a corner. Cornering, as Yuri uh, uh, showed to you, would be actually increasing the probability of, 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 a, of a crazy response in the corner. We don't want that. And because we don't want that, together with a short-run embargo and more openness to lifting sanctions in the future, I'm also a proponent of taking very seriously the step uh, um, forward towards neutrality made by Zelensky and perhaps discuss what this neutrality new deal that will come up hopefully in a peace treaty with different types of guarantees different from membership of NATO, what could they mean in the future for rediscussing rediscussing the, 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 the principles of NATO because what we want to avoid as a second long run thing is a construction of a NATO against anti-NATO coalition with China inside. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Massimo. I turn my back to, to you, sorry. And give the floor to Teresa. I speak loud. I was told. Uh, and introduce yourself properly. I am Teresa. I'm the Eastern Europe and Russia coordinator of the World Equality Lab, and I'm a researcher at the New Observatory. Both are research institutes that are hosted here at the Paris School of Economics. And so my research is uh, focused on inequality and on taxation, um, as you might deduct from my research presentations. Um, I would like to bring in another aspect. Uh, I would like to bring in the aspect of effective sanctions against oligarchs, so uh, against powerful and rich Russians. Um, and uh, this, this is basically based on a note we have written two weeks ago, we have published two weeks ago with Panayotis Nikolaidis, because Chancel, Thomas, and Gabriel Sukhman together. 
And in this note, we wanted to bring together what we know about the Russian wealth inequality, what we know about the phenomenon of offshore wealth, and we wanted to link it to a policy recommendation uh, for the EU leaders. Um, and we think one way forward uh, for the EU is to now not only focus on, on, on sanctioned individuals, but really think about the structural problem behind it. Because the structural problem behind it is currently, uh, or what the task forces that are enacted now have is that member states <coughs> do not know who owns what in their territory, or at least not in a comprehensive way. And also the task forces, they have the problem that they first have to gather information before the sanctions against those so-called oligarchs can become effective. And this is why we advocate to solve the structural problem to make um, the sanctions against the oligarchs more effective, um, but also to, um, to solve much more structural problems because with the uh, European asset registry, which gathers information on who owns what in the member states, we can also tackle problems like tax evasion, money laundering, and everything that is connected to illicit financial flows. So this is basically the abstract, and now I would like to walk you a bit through the details of this note. Uh, I would like to start with the observation that Russia shows the highest wealth inequality um, in Europe. The wealthiest 1% of Russians hold about half of total Russian household wealth. And when you compare it on the right-hand panel uh, to other countries like France, where the top, uh, the wealthiest 1% hold about 27% of total uh, French household wealth, and in the US, this number is about 35%. So um, in France and in, in, in the US, the wealthiest top 1%, 1% of the population hold about one third of total household wealth. This already seems quite a lot, but in Russia, it's a totally total different order of magnitude. It's about half of the uh, household wealth. Um, and uh, this can, um, and then there's another aspect um, concerning wealth inequality in Russia, that is that a lot of rich Russian wealth is held abroad, is held in offshore centers and in tax havens. Um, research by Novokmet, Piketty, and Sukman has shown that about um, half of Russian household wealth is held abroad. So there's as much wealth, financial wealth, held by rich Russians outside of Russia that is held as well by the Russian population in Russia itself. And this phenomenon is especially pronounced for the wealthiest. So this is a, so taken from a study by Alsat, Seta, Yonis, and Sukman, and they zoom into the 0.01%. For Russia, uh, with an adult population of around 100 million, this is about 10,000 individuals. And they find that um, those 10,000 individuals, more or less, hold more than 12% of total Russian household wealth. And 60% of this is held in offshore tax havens. Um, so there seems to be a link between this strong concentration of wealth and holding um, and channeling wealth through uh, offshore tax sales. But I want to underline here that this is not a particularly Russian-specific phenomenon. This is an international phenomenon. The, um, the same study finds that the equivalent of 10% of global GDP is held as offshore wealth. Uh, in 2016, that was more than 8 trillion US dollars according to Gabriel's And also when we look at the leaks data, so we have now all the leaks, the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers, the offshore leaks, etc. Also, they show the same thing, that the beneficiaries and the users of shell companies to, to, to hide your wealth or to channel your wealth uh, through offshore centers, they come from all over the world. So this is really an international phenomenon. And so we should tackle or uh, see this as an international phenomenon, and we should uh, have a much broader policy implication than just um, basically focused on, on, on um, the sanctioned individuals here. Uh, and this is why we propose um, a European asset registry. And let me just um, walk you a bit through what we mean by this. So the European asset registry should solve the problem that the European member states currently do not comprehensively know who owns what in their territory. And this is not because there is no information, there is information. But this information is uh, very dispersed in public companies, in, in, uh, in public institutions, in private companies. Um, access is restricted sometimes even uh, for the financial authorities itself. The data is not linked. So bank account data is not linked to real estate data. 
it's not linked to company ownership and it's not linked across member states uh, as well um and and this data is also not um automatically verified so some data actually who owns what might be completely outdated and it also basically gives an incentive to this report because if no one checks why not um so the, the european asset registry is supposed or our proposition is that we create an institution that solves this problem that gathers systematically this information from all available data sources that verifies this information and with this database, one can check on sanctioned individuals, but also on um, suspicious cases of um, that hint at money laundering or exhibition. And there, the key aspect of this asset registry is that it is comprehensive. Because we see uh, right now, if there are blind spots in the coverage of such an asset registry, then the persons that want to stay in, they stay in. Uh, they use those blind spots. And what does comprehensiveness mean? First of all, it means um, that it has to be comprehensive across all asset types. So bank deposit, but also real estate, uh, company ownership, yachts and planes, uh, and so on. So this is the first, because we have seen that if we are one of those asset types, then people that want to stay in should be those asset types. The second is it has to be comprehensive across jurisdictions. Um, we currently already have beneficial ownership registries in, in the EU but only for companies that are incorporated in the territory, but not for companies that are incorporated outside, maybe in a tax haven and then hold real estate in the EU. So we have to close those points first. And this sounds like very ambitious uh, to, to build up such a comprehensive asset registry, but let me assure you um, that we already have a lot of those building blocks. And just uh, very quickly, um, member states have real estate or land registers and they have company registers. But they have different qualities. So we have to increase quality and they are not linked. But they are good building blocks. Then we have the central security depositories. Those are private companies, um, Clearstream and Europe. They facilitate trade of securities. So they have some notion of who owns the stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have seen in the last 10 years about uh, a lot of progress um, at the level of the OECD and the EU. The automatic exchange of information under the common reporting standard really brought some financial transparency in, into financial assets. Currently, almost 100 jurisdictions annually and automatically exchange information, for example, on bank accounts and other financial assets. Uh, so this is what brought really some financial transparency, but only in financial assets. And then you have other blind spots like real estate. And at the EU, we have currently the anti money laundering directives. And this is also moving very fast because the fifth Atimon Learning Directive um, obliged the member states to set up beneficial ownership registries for companies and trusts where you have to register who is the beneficial owner of those companies. Those are still highly insufficient, and even the European Commission would, would say, well, the implementation, we, we really have to uh, make this better. But there's already the sixth Atimon Learning Directive on its way or discussed, uh, and this, this should. Um, First of all, close some of the most important blind spots. And this basically was just to tell you that the European Union has the organizational and the informational capacities um, to, to basically establish financial transparency and to establish the European Asset Registry that would link all this information, gather all this information, see the blind spots, spots close the blind spots, verify this information, and then we can really. Um, have effective san sanctions against the Russian oligarchs, but also this would tackle much more long standing problems like um, tax evasion, money laundering, corruption, everything that is linked to uh, illicit financial flows. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we, we move to Moins on uh, what has already been uh, discussed. I say again. To be the implication of running out of gas. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll try to be quick. Thanks uh, to the organizers for having me. I'm more Turek. I'm a professor at uh, Sciences Po, fortunate to be a colleague of uh, Sergei. And uh, as you mentioned, I was involved in a study that uh, we did reasonably fast after the war started, the invasion occurred on uh, the consequences for uh, Germany. Let me, I want to make three points. I want to 
quickly say what the German situation is. The German situation is uh, that the country has decided to uh, have uh, to convert and to transition to green energy uh, within a, an ambitious uh, roughly 15 year framework. Mm -hmm. And it has decided that the bridge technology to get the country from A to B, from fossil to green to, re to completely renewable, was gas. Uh, and it had made that bet on that to specific uh, fuel. And at the same time, if the decision was made, I don't think it was ever explicit, but it was implicit and many industry um, representatives did not object uh, that uh, not only was there going to be a bet on gas as the bridge technology to, before going green, uh, but also to make a bet on Russia as being the main supplier of that bridge technology. Um, that has resulted in a, a dependency of roughly 50% of German gas imports on Russia. Uh, they are all pipeline imports, which will be uh, important when we talk about sanction design, because Russia cannot sell this gas uh, anywhere else easily, which you know gives makes this a little bit. And that was a key reason where people thought this is kind of a mutually assured situation, uh, not not too dissimilar from what um, we heard earlier from Yuri. Um, right now, obviously, that um, bet has gone badly wrong. And um, the uh, German establishment is, is rushing to reconfigure and to think about uh, alternatives. Um, the, um, that, that brings me to my second point. I want, I want to be quick is uh, what if, so what if there was an embargo or what if Putin uh, himself uh, decides not to um, deliver any fossil fuels to Germany anymore? Um, it's very important to distinguish between oil, gas, and coal. Uh, Germany depends on all three to some degree on Russia, but oil and uh, coal can be substituted very quickly with, even in the case of oil, and that's a discussion right now, uh, with minimal economic costs. The problem with oil is that there are two East German refineries that work on Russian oil, which is more sour and heavier than, than, the, the, than the North Sea and the American oil. And those refineries um, basically produce the fuels for most of these German gas stations. Um, and that is a sort of logistical challenge. Uh, it's also a political economy challenge because the East is also the region of Germany where there's a strong sort of right-wing AFD type of uh, vote base. And um, Berlin is very uh, scared that even small disruptions to uh, gasoline uh, supplies in East Germany would you know, uh, create kind of a yellow vest situation in, in Germany as well. Uh, but oil is it's a logistical challenge, it's not a real challenge, it's not a real challenge, it's not an economic challenge, um, and, and, and neither is coal. So it's really about gas, and um, that's, a, um, that's where our paper came. So what did we do is we looked at the numbers and uh, said there's going to be some short-run LNG substitution, there's somewhat more oil that can come from Norway, uh, gas sorry, that can come from Norway, uh, but in the most likely scenario, there's going to, to the German economy would have to do, in the case of an embargo, would have to do with 20 to 30 percent less gas supplies uh, over the next year. So then we the question is, how do you model that? Uh, we turn to um, what we think is a state of the art multi sector uh, network production model, the Bakhti Fari, the various versions, but the 2021 version of that. We can go more into detail if you like. But that's a, that's importantly that's a model that takes um, production networks seriously, um, and um, still in the end, um, you know, we, we we discussed this at length in the paper. Um, there are implicit assumptions about it as necessities of substitution in this model, and those are the I think those are the key parameters we need to discuss in these models. Um, the even the twenty to thirty percent shortfall of gas does not lead to major uh, economic, uh, I, I, this, is, this is a lot of the German debate that went, is this major or is this not? So in the, in the baseline case, it's something sub 1% GDP loss. Why is that? Well, because trade is an insurance. So instead of producing fertilizer at home, you import it from Canada. The overall um, economic effect is, is, is minimal and, and that really comes out, I think you know these models very well. Really what comes out of this is, is to what extent openness well, trade is an insurance mechanism. So you don't produce at home, but you import, and you can also import along the value chain. You can import um, um, and products. Um, 
So that number, 0.5 to 1%, uh, you know, is low. And uh, to um, construct a risk scenario, obviously, this is also like a purely real model. There are no nominal rigidities. There is no Keynesian demand side amplification. Um, to become a little bit more um, maybe um, um, pessimistic, we um, also looked at two simplified versions of this model in which we um, in which we simulate the effects of a 15% reduction in overall energy consumption or a, a, a specific 20 to 30% shock to the gas consumption and uh, plugged in into um, the sort of a, into simple production function framework, uh, empirically observed elasticities of substitution in industry and for household sector. So there's two, there's two elasticities of substitution, uh, and these are short run elasticities of substitution. Both, there's a couple of natural experiments from the US where you know what households are doing when the gas price goes up a lot. So how much do they substitute in the short run? And there's a very good, there's also, I mean, there's plenty of studies. There's also a very good meta study that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and there's a good, but there's a, like, I think in terms of quality, there's a very nice study for the UK, which especially addresses the question that German industry is worried or is most worried about, namely the use of gas for heating purposes in industry. It's not about the material usage of gas in chemical industry. That's a very small part, and that probably there the world is the answer. You can't replace it. You need that gas. But like 90% of the gas used in industry is used for heating and cooling purposes, where in theory, you can use all kinds of other fuels to do that. You could use oil, you could use coal, you can, you can use electricity to some degree. And uh, plugging in that, um, uh, that uh, so we looked at this study for the UK, which exactly looked at that, so the system for substitution of gas and oil usage in industry for heating purposes, which somewhere around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. The important thing, it's not zero. Um, and uh, then we have these elasticities that we really want to be conservative. Um, uh, the, we have the empirically found um, um, uh, observed elasticities of, of, of substitution. We have those to be conservative, and then we ended up with something like two to three percent. Um, that is also, and I want to um, and come to an end. That is also the um, the, the number that uh, the the German Council of Economic Advisors now has converged to. There's one study out there by the trade unions, um, the trade union institute, which in uh, a delicate turn, I think they haven't done themselves, but they have outsourced to to Niger and London, and uh, the, even the model didn't converge. They came up with a number of six percent, wherever that's from. Uh, but this is where we stand, somewhere between 1% and 6% GDP effect. Um, for us, that's still the same ballpark area. The background was that the economics minister, uh, Robert Habeck, and also the chancellor, um, used words that, um, so one was in German, Massenarmut, so mass poverty, and uh, the other one was Verelendung, so, so really the decline, invoking the idea of this is the end of prosperity in, in, in Germany, generally speaking. Um, and you know the, the reference point was something like a 20 to 30 percent GDP drop. Um, that's that's evidently not true. Uh, it's going to be a severe recession. It's going to be COVID style. That's probably the risk scenario. It could be less. And let me spend one more minute on what's the situation now um, and what has happened. So we haven't been successful. Um, industry has been successful. Industry has the ear of uh, of politicians. And industry. Um, I mean, this is. Again, a delicate uh, insight that the same industrial lobbies that uh, said for a decade that it's not a problem to become dependent on Russia now say it's a big problem and we can't get out of this very quickly. Um, there's a little bit of a tragedy of the common situation going on that, of course, on the level of the individual company, if you're like a glass producing company in Germany, it's really like it's going to be tough. It's not that we don't have the, the money or the fiscal resources to say, like, okay, we pay you short work schemes for a year. 100% replacement rate. We could afford all of that. But these people are very vocal and um, they see this glass manufacturing is not going to happen in Germany for the next year or two, or maybe it's never going to come back. And they pick up the phone and they find a, an audience in Berlin that is, uh, that is very perceptive. Whereas uh, on a sort of aggregate perspective, on a, from an economics perspective, uh, whether you know, these individual glass companies really, you know, probably we have to, in, in this green transition, have to um, change that industrial structure. Anyways, the big fear is uh, political economy. I think people understand now that this is still doable. This is doable, but um, there is no, there's very little appetite, even in the Green Party, which is a big surprise. 
um, and even like in the rank and file of the Green Party, um, there's very little appetite to be proactive and sort of trigger a recession uh, without uh, having a need to do that. Um, and uh, so sort of the idea of like, you know, Charles just got into, into power 100 days ago, like the first thing you do is like consciously steer the economy in a recession and there's very little appetite. And, and, and I mean, for better or worse, the yellow vest, the French example is invoked very, very frequently as the main political economy fear of, uh, of doing this. Um, I think that's. I think that's from my side. I mean, there's, there's plenty of plenty of uh, other things to, to be said about um, how economic policy advice in the, such situations is, is is disregarded. It was a talk show. Maybe this is the last this nice example. It was a talk show, uh, the most important talk show in Germany, um, just Sunday a week ago, where the only guest was the chancellor, and the chancellor actually referred to our study and. Called it irresponsible mathematical modeling, and you cannot possibly do policy on the basis of that. And that he had talked to um, representatives of industry, and those have all told him that this is impossible, and this is how economic advice is thought and is sought and integrated. In, in, in I'll leave it here. And I don't know this is great. Thank you so much. And thanks for the debate. The yellow jacket is not what you want to draw in for sure. Okay, so Idel on refugees. Yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, Idel Rappaport, I'm a professor here at PSC and also the director of the Club of International Relations. So, uh, as such, uh, one of the organizers of this uh, round table. Uh, so, thank you to, to the participants. Also, would like to add uh, Timo Friedrich uh, from the Kiev School of Economics, who has been very uh, helpful uh, in helping me uh, putting this uh, round table together. So I'm going to talk about a different topic. Uh, I, I would say it's for the day after. Uh, you know, I would relate this to Yuri's presentation by saying we, we hope there will be a day after. Uh, and for the other presentations are really about sanctions and what we can do today to try to, uh, to change the course of things through, through sanctions as well. But the, the issue of refugee is not the, the, the most pressing one, but it will, uh, it will come on the table. Uh, it's already quite, uh, we, we have the 4 million people that, uh, a bit more, that left Ukraine. As I will show you, they are uh, mostly concentrated for now in the neighboring uh, uh, countries, but also in, in the West of, of Europe. It's stopping, it's, it's building up. Uh, and uh, when the war ends, uh, and the, the dust uh, settles, we will see how many people will be in need of a permanent uh, resettlement. And uh, when that comes, I think we, we can build on the experience from the previous refugee crisis, which was not as big in terms of numbers, but was very serious and, and led to, uh, to a lot of uh, political discussions and also to a lot of economics research, which I think we, we can learn from to kind of not wait uh, for the, after the war and the reconstruction and the, the resettlement, but already now think of uh, what we should do to be, to be prepared. So just uh, the numbers as, as of the day before yesterday, coming from the UNHCR, there are currently more than 4 million uh, Ukrainian refugees abroad. Uh, most of them in Poland, as you can see, 2.5 million. Many in uh, neighboring countries, Romania, Moldova, Hungary. I don't know if we should call the Belarus and the Russian Federation. These are, these are for displaced population, I'm not sure how to call them. Uh, but we have also, uh, I just checked before the round table, 35,000 in France, 300,000 in Germany, uh, 70,000 in Italy, or 250,000 in, in Austria. Okay, so it's also a Western EU issue and that will come more and more powerful as time passes. So what I want to, to, to talk about is, you know, for now, I would say these uh, refugees, wherever they are in the EU, they are under temporary protection. So they can stay legally anywhere in the EU. They can register their kids in school, they can work. Okay, but that's a temporary protection. It can, it's for one year, it can be renewed, but at some point, you know, when 
the war ends, that temporary protection will fall, and then we will have to, to see what, what happens. So what I want to, to say is that following the previous wave of refugees, there, there was, as I said, uh, many uh, people in different fields, including economics, who, who worked on this uh, issue of uh, refugee resettlement, allocation of refugees within countries, across countries, integration policies, and I just want to, to, to be quick, but to, to show that there, there is a lot uh, which has been done and what, that we can learn from uh, the conclusions uh, to, to think of, as to what to do for the, the next uh, wave, which is building. And, and uh, uh, so I will start from three examples. I will have three examples. That's a paper of mine uh, from a few years ago, which uh, uses uh, different economic uh, tools about tradable quotas and matching to talk about allocation of refugees across countries. Okay, so it's a mix of, so if you remember in 2015, the EU had agreed on the quota system for Syrian refugees, uh, according to some key based on the, the, the capacity of absorption of each country, uh, mix of uh, GDP and population. Uh, and they agreed on the quota system. So giving each country a share of responsibility so that was a huge step forward. Uh, it didn't work for a few reasons. The main reason was a very strong opposition of the Visegrad group, which a bit, uh, you know, cynically is now the countries uh, which host the most refugees, so Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Uh, and matching. Matching uh, is, uh, so refugee has been considered as a potential application of matching models. So it's how, how to match places and people based on the characteristics of the places and the characteristics of the people. So combining these two tools, uh, we showed essentially from, through theory and through simulations that this mechanism was uh, able to, to better match people to places, reduce the cost for countries of hosting refugees. So relaxing what we call participation of trend and allowing for hosting more or the same number at a lower cost uh, of, of refugees. A second example is uh, using uh, big data and machine learning uh, techniques. It's a paper published in Science in 2018 by uh, many people, including mostly people from the Stanford Immigration Lab, uh, where what they did is essentially to gather uh, historical data on different cohorts of refugees placed administratively either in Switzerland or in the United States. Many countries have this administrative placement. They don't let refugees go where they want within the country, but they place them according to some, essentially randomly, uh, because they don't want to refugees to, to, to choose. Okay, their, their point is that refugees should agree to go anywhere if they are in real need of, uh, of, of asylum. Uh, but this is forgetting, of course, that you know, choosing is also the main uh, condition for success in terms of integration. So this is what this paper shows. They, they, they collected you know, data on, on many uh, past cohorts. And based on this, try to find what is the best match between uh, a, a, a municipality uh, based on certain characteristics, its hosting a characteristic, the presence of school, hospital, the type of jobs, and so on and the characteristics of the refugees. And they simulated for the last cohort, they did a comparison of what uh, happened to them based on the current uh, administrative procedure and what the algorithm would uh, advise to, to do. And they found uh, tremendous differences, uh, like for the US, uh, a jump of 34 to 48% in employment after three months or for Switzerland, 15 to 26% uh, after one year. So very big differences for, on that dimension, but you can do it on, on any dimension you like. And they are now in the process, they apparently convinced the Swiss government to, to do a pilot uh, to, to, to compare the, to, to, to look at the real, not the simulated effectiveness of this uh, mechanism and this algorithm. The third example is one of many, many papers which have been written on uh, evaluation of uh, integration policies for refugees. This is a, a paper by in the last issue of the Journal of Economic Geography by three Italian economists. And what they do, they first 
document something which is known that refugees pay a penalty uh, compared to other immigrants with the same characteristics. As you can see, on average, they compare 20 different European countries uh, and they, are, they have lower income, lower employment uh, rates, and, and so on. Uh, and they examine what kind of policies are uh, more effective or less effective. So the first thing they look at is those dispersion policies that I just mentioned, that uh, governments tend to disperse a bit randomly, administratively, uh, refugees. Uh, and they show that indeed this is detrimental to their integration, at least uh, in terms of job market uh, performance. Uh, but also other things like the showing the importance of their waiting time until you get the refugee status, because in many countries, asylum seekers, those who have not yet received the status of refugee cannot work. And this is really detrimental for long term labor market performance. Um, for example, or whether asylum seekers should be or not allowed to work until their uh, request is, is examined. So all I want to say here is that there is a lot of economic research either on the placement across country within country and the type of policies that favor integration. And so uh, this will uh, apply to the wave of Ukrainian refugees, which we hope will be not too big, uh, but that's uh, not our, our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Eden, and thank you again for your presentation. This is a great uh, list of panelists, really. So the, the last but not least speaker is uh, Timo Fly from the Kiev uh, School of Economics. Is he here? I just uh, left, I think. Yes. I just wait. I don't know if it's for good or... Uh, I would say for good. It's, uh, no, for good. Uh, for the next hour, or, 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 or if it's a toilet break, or. <laughs> okay, so why don't we uh, engage into uh, the conversation with the panelists, and uh, as soon as he comes back, uh, we get back to, uh, to his comments. All right. So let's um, let's open up to to questions, um, either online. Do you have questions online or, or from the floor? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Anir Sharifi. I work with Arjun, which is an investment fund uh, specializing on energy transition. Uh, and I'd like to ask a question to Professor Shularik uh, regarding hydrogen. Uh, do you see this as being a topic? Uh, sorry. That's bad. Okay. <laughs> Shall, shall I repeat? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, so, uh, dear professor, would you expect hydrogen to be one of the solutions or one of the ways for um, uh, for uh, countries to? Once we can go, to be able to get uh, yeah. access to uh, to sovereign energy and uh, also. Uh, Yeah. 
question. And there are some reasons that people are going to return. And I wonder if you have an update on that. And this was the last case would be just for this report that uh, last year, before the war, 12 million Ukrainians want to leave Ukraine permanently. So I wonder if it's uh, well, the likely that these people don't want to return, irrespective of the outcome. Um, okay. um, we heard a few weeks ago at the uh, end of the central bank uh, wanted to resign and then they did not. So, do you, do you know how, in general, the uh, political elite, okay. unfortunately, uh, is reacting as well as the I am now intervene except for supplying arms to Ukraine uh, and to Moritz. From the moment uh, that you know Germany cuts in on Russian uh, gas, would do so for the sake of public good, you know, to to all uh, of the EU and all democracies. Shouldn't we think of compensation mechanisms to, to make this happen? Okay. Do you have another first batch of questions? We, we return the question. So, uh, so I guess the first, the first batch of questions is really uh, for you. Uh, uh, it's, uh, let, me, let me also rephrase them somehow. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, Germany, but another case is Italy. Mm -hmm. So, Italy is a case where 40% uh, of all energy supply comes from gas, 50% of which coming from, uh, uh, from Russia. So, 20% of all energy uh, in Italy would, uh, would come from. Uh, come from Russia. So if I apply your number, I guess I should simply multiply by two the number that you gave for Germany, because for Germany, energy on gas is 25% for total energy, and half of which comes from, from Russia. So we sort of in a ratio of one to two. So for Italy, your numbers, if you have a range from one to six, it would be in a range from two to 12 percent in the case of Italy. So my question is really, uh, can we, can we, can we apply your number to Italy and simply basically multiply them by two to have another mm -hmm. So that would be my uh, my addition to, to the question that we that we that we asking. Please go ahead. Right. Let me start with that question and try to be quick with all these others. Um, very loud. Very loud. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start. Yeah, but then don't even know the question. So. Um, <laughs> We'll figure out. So the, the total German energy <coughs> dependence on Russian gas is about 15%. Yeah. Yeah. Total, so, ga total gas total gas is 25%, percent, right. half of which coming from Russia. Right. Yeah. More or less. Right? More or less. So, so that's yeah. Yeah. That it, it depends 15, also on which year you look at. Right. Like, so you said for Italy it's 20? For Italy, the overall dependency on gas is 40%, half of which coming from Russia. So it's like so 20 to 20. It's not a big difference. It's 20. My number is 12 to 20. I think, I mean, yeah. I, mean, that's that's fair, yeah. I, mean I think, that may be your I think overall speaking, I think in the, in the Bakery Fari model, you would not, you would like have a hard time getting large effects for Italy. No, this is um, the 6% number for Germany, which is like maybe the one that's scary, is one um, where, um, you know, you have assumptions about nominal rigidities that you probably cannot transfer easily from Germany to Italy. I would take that number really with a dose of, I mean, a big grain of salt. Um, I would, like, if you want a consensus number, I think the median that reached from Goldman Sachs to our study is somewhere two to three percent. And I guess in the Italian case, then it would be a little bit more. Um, we need compensation, I think, you know, you could have argued the same. I mean, this is this is bad policy and bad luck coming together in a way. 
um, in the euro crisis, there was also bad policy and bad luck, and it was very hard to get that compensation going. I think Germany has the resources to deal with that, and it wouldn't address the main fear, which is really, um, it's not that we cannot pay for unemployed people. It's you don't want people to get unemployed. I think that's the real political economy constraint. It's not that you could say we replace your salary at 100% for a year. It would, be, it would make a difference for the budget, I and mean, it would, but it would be if it finance it. Uh, but the politicians don't want to send anyone into unemployment. That's, that's a very, this is like very different from getting some, some differential compensation um, through the uh, public sector. Hydrogen, I think everything is on the table. I think in the short run, probably it's not, it's not going to make a big difference, but it's, 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 it's certainly, and that's why I say like, I'm surprised that the base of the Green Party is so quiet and supporting that, you know, with the Social Democrats, you understand they're kind of close to industry, the trade unions are, in the end, this is the same, you know, the same part of the economy. I mean, German industry is 20% GDP. We're re- effectively, there is a group of trade unions and industry associations making policy for Germany now that represents 20% of output. It's also not, you know, it's, 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 it's structured, but you understand why the social democrats that are really embedded in that trade union industry world are very cautious, that the Greens are supporting this quietly is the biggest surprise because for them, this could be, the, of the opportunity to like condense and accelerate an energy transition from 15 or 10 years into three years. Uh, but the economics minister who happens to be green is very, um, very much online. Um, last question on is it static models. No? So we can't say anything about, about the dynamics. Um, and I guess like if you think about the elasticity of substitution from one day to the other, it's probably zero. Um, so in the, in the very, 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 very short run, the world is the opposite. But as soon as you extend it to six months, then the world is no longer the You have so you have all kinds of substitution mechanisms kicking in, imports, um, shifts in, 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 in electricity generation, uh, because you have, Germany has all these old coal plants that you can fire on for now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, that's why it's so important that they start now. And this is a message we don't get across. Like, ideally, you want to do forward guidance now and say like, gas prices will remain high whatever, because industry is now speculating that this war will be over, and somehow in three months, they can go back to more. But you want to tell them, no, this is a new state of the world, you need to adjust. Gas prices are going to remain high, and if, if something happens, we're going to keep them high credibly. So for this adjustment to kick in now, and that's very hard to communicate politically. Also, what's very hard to communicate politically is, is, is the concept of elasticity of substitution, generally speaking, you know, this is like, because they, they, these companies come with very precise examples saying, we make glass, we need energy, we make a loss when the gas price is above whatever, 15, uh, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and we can say like, there's gonna be thousands of ways how the price mechanism in the overall economy means that we're gonna adjust. Um, and that's very, that's very uncom- that's very imprecise. You can say like, there's input substitution. Okay, they get that, but then they say like, hmm, we don't like having fertilizer produced in Canada, and so we kind of like fertilizer production in Germany. What happens to these workers? So that they get, but it's also complicated. But all these endogenous responses to price signals, the price system in the market economy doing its job, is very hard to communicate. Okay, great. Have they had the Russia? Oh, uh, we had this. I, I'm making it. I think it's five times as high as the back country. Four, or five times, roughly in that, roughly in that. And I think that's important to know. Like I say, gave it no more. But gas is sold through pipelines. Russia doesn't have the infrastructure to sell it in any other way. If they don't sell it, they have to. I think they have to. Uh, basically, they lose even the. They have to put concrete on top of these wells because. Um, you can't, I mean, you could burn it, I guess, but even that, I, so there is kind of a mutual situation, Bitcoin. but, hmm? oh yeah, no, no, but I mean, you can't get rid of, you could mine Bitcoin, yeah, and that's what I mean. yeah, okay, but um, there is very little, um, but even with the oil, I mean, if you extend the sanctions regime to the ships and the, and the you know, what we've done in the case of Iran, then that's also limited. Less, 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 but it's less limited, but it's you also, can, you can send it to Dubai, to China, so let's, it's not the same it's kind, it's not the same, yeah. and you can stop it. And you need the ship. Okay, but tagging. So go on, on, on the question. Mm-hmm. If I may add something also from, uh, from reading what you mean. I think it's important uh, in the case of sanctions against uh, 
China too, against Russia to, to distinguish what we are just talking now. This is structural sanction, so it has to free the cash out of the central bank. And the longer run the sanction, uh, that is the question is, assume there is, assuming there is a ceasefire, that uh, something uh, begins to, to stop. Uh, question is really, uh, so do we do we stop the sanctions? Do we give back the, the, the central bank's reserve? Uh, or do we believe that this, we Europeans and the nurse, we, we don't like what we've seen and we uh, we are we are you know we want to we want to go beyond so far as the Putin regime is concerned, beyond the ceasefire itself, assuming that there is one in the next uh, six months. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. In the uh, tradition of Moritz, let me start with the last question. So um, <laughs> I think um, I think uh, it is important to understand what the goal of sanctions is now. So people think we want to deter Putin. We want Putin to change his behavior because he's worried about the economic recession. Putin has shown he doubles down. So now the goal of sanctions is to destroy Putin's ability to continue war. As simple as that. Destroy Putin's autonomy. Destroy Putin's fiscal revenue. So this is this is the goal of the sanctions right now. And uh, he says, I still have cash, and I will continue the war. And that means sanctions are not enough. Now, on long run and short run sanctions, uh, one thing I would advertise, uh, Yuri was uh, actually the most essential part of this group. Uh, he put together a group on what to do the day after. We assume the day after will come. And so tomorrow on Box EU, there'll be a report published on the reconstruction plan for Ukraine. And um, I cannot spoil it, but it looks like um, there'll be no Russian money left. So somebody will have to pay for that, and uh, probably uh, central bank reserves through reparations will be somehow used for that. That is not for sure. There are court decisions to be made, but uh, um, I think uh, they'll be very hard to give this money back to uh, Mr. Putin simply because there'll be a court decision. Somebody will have to pay for reparations. Now, in longer term, I guess your question is to what extent if Putin goes back to pre-war borders, Sanctions should be removed, and the answer to this question is it's very unlikely that Mr. Putin goes to pre war uh, borders. But just a ceasefire. Assuming just a ceasefire will make the current more or less border, new yeah. borders, and Donbass and Crimea. So, so, US says if Ukraine is fine, we are fine, but Ukraine will not be fine with current borders, with, with the current, uh, it's 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 current line, front line, let's call it this way. And that means that uh, a lot of sanctions will remain in place. Some sanctions may be removed, but a lot of sanctions will remain in place. Another issue which uh, is very important, looks like for Putin, the war is the modus operandi. The operandi, so as a political economist, can tell you that. He doesn't have any more uh, sources of legitimacy, so there'll be a new war. And uh, again, the goal of sanctions is to make sure that the new war Putin launches, at that war, he will be much weaker. weaker. And that's already the case, and uh, I guess I guess that's why sanctions will not be removed overall. Which brings me to Francesca's question: whether Putin may be able to find other fiscal revenue. So the answer to this question is: uh, it's pretty much impossible. It's a recession of minus ten percent. Tax everything you can tax, and this is the number I gave you: the seventy seventy-five dollars per barrel is the number where you balance. Uh, uh, all uh, you balance uh, revenues and expenditure. Uh, remember that other fiscal revenues during the recession suffer a lot. Right? Then you have automatic stabilizers that increase anyway. And that can give you actually the uh, rationale. So Mr. Putin announced that he will help the population. And he announced measures of half a percentage point of GDP. So it's completely different order of magnitude. He's running out of cash. And uh, in that sense, in that sense, if he has hundred dollars per barrel and full volume of experts, then your question is irrelevant, and he will be doing fine and saving money. He will not save this money in American dollars for sure, but he will uh, he will probably somehow try to buy some food. Now. Uh, let me comment on a couple of other things. So Kivel asked about uh, elite. Elite is extremely unhappy. Uh, so yesterday, one of the richest men in Russia, the owner of one of the biggest steel enterprises, gave an interview, Mr. Lysian, uh, where he actually more or less welcomed sanctions. So he didn't criticize Mr. Putin, but he said, we can understand the West imposing sanctions on me. My business is destroyed. I'm very unhappy. But I understand that there is a war, and the West has to do what they can do. 
And that was quite unusual. Some other oligarchs said, we don't know what we can do with Mr. Putin and we have no money to hire a, a driver and the cleaning staff. And so we're very happy in our London houses. Uh, but this guy actually spoke very clearly. Other, other oligarchs also spoke very clearly that this is the worst economic disaster ever in our lives. And I mean, that coming from Russians, it's a lot. Uh, in the last 30 years, there have been quite a number of disasters. And uh, one other thing which I would mention is the poisoning of Mr. Abramovich. Now, Mr. Abramovich is one of the closest oligarchs to Mr. Putin. He is uh, uh, the person who was very instrumental in bringing Mr. Putin to power, uh, one of the richest people in Russia. He was used by Mr. Putin as an intermediary in negotiations with Ukrainians, and he was poisoned and he lost sight for several hours. And so nobody now knows what it, what it was. Some people would say it was a warning. He didn't die, so maybe it was just a message. Uh, be very loyal to us, otherwise we'll kill you completely. His sight is now bad, so yeah. Uh, another message is, uh, another option could be Mr. Abramovich poisoned himself to signal to the West that he's different from Mr. Putin. So that is a costly signaling, if you like, because again, this business is very dangerous. You may miscalculate with the dosage. And another, another uh, uh, version, is that they wanted to kill somebody on Ukrainian delegation. But uh, again, Mr. Abramovich opened an envelope which he was not supposed to open, something like this. In any event, this is not a good job, right? It's, it's a very dangerous job to be Mr. Putin. So, so all the elites are unhappy, but there is also this memory that Mr. Putin can put pretty much everybody, including his own close, very, very close friends. And that sounds, it's not clear to what extent the palace who will happen now. Political economists can tell you that dictatorships end uh, either through appraisal of, of the public, where policemen don't shoot because policemen are not paying, paid well as well, or through coup d'etat. And coup d'etat is successful uh, uh, when it's successful. It's impossible to predict. If you know exactly which colonel will kill Mr. Putin, that colonel is gone already, right? So, so we cannot really predict that. And just, just on a on, on, on couple of things on timing on, on, on sanctions, the proposal I mentioned also financing the war, the proposal is tax on gas. Uh, so the proposal is 40% tax on Russian gas, which will reduce imports of Russian gas by 80% in Europe. And the price mechanism will assure that this remaining 20% will be consumed by those who cannot function without Russian gas. The gas, they will be prepared to pay the highest price. So this is, this is a reasonable proposal. This proposal may also be extended to timing, where you introduce 5% tax now, next week you introduce 10%, next week you introduce 15% as long as the war continues. And that, of course, may actually finish the war really quickly. And that may actually mean that you don't need to suffer too much. Maybe you don't need to impose the whole 40%. And that is important for European economy as well. So people underappreciate what extent this war has already been costly to Europe in economic terms. The forecast for European GDP growth for 2022 has been downgraded by 1.5 percentage point already. Uh, and uh, that's OECD forecast, Goldman Sachs our forecast, okay. So Europe has already lost a lot of time because of this war and uh, will continue moving as long as the war continues. And um, uh, impact on Russia, I mentioned the recession forecast, minus 10%. Uh, further, uh, further embargo, we don't really know. It's really uncharted territory. Models don't really work. It may introduce full embargo. We know the budget problem will be huge, but we don't know the problem. And finally, one more thing on, on refugees. Uh, this is not a typical refugee crisis. Families do not live together. They're separate. Women and kids leave, men stay behind. So if you run a survey before the war and 12 million Ukrainians tell you they want to leave, that's probably about all families living. Now, the service among the refugees now give you a number like 80%, 90% of refugees want to come back to Ukraine. And some are already coming back. So it's a very specific uh, refugee crisis, very different from a uh, Syrian refugee crisis when 50, 60% were men. Now, pretty much 0% of men. Or, or these are men who are above six years old because of mobilization policies of Ukrainian government. Just, just I want to add one, one thing on, on the sanctions. On, uh, we understand that from the economy at large, as you, as you discussed, and the risk of inflation, and the fact that the key risk of the economy is inflation. If you don't have the fiscal needs to sustain your, your 
budget. But so far, the war itself is not certain. And what, what Putin needs in order to have the tanks and so on are either things which are produced domestically at the risk of, any, of inflation, but still it can be produced, or needs, as you said, about the tanks, need to be imported. And this is where the sanction operates. So I understand that, that alleviating the sanction, I mean, allevi I mean Opening up this gas so channel and replenish the reserve is good for the economy at large. It's better for the economy at large and gives some leeway to put it. But so far, the war itself is concerned. The direct sanctions on imports is the one critical matter that prevents the army from replenishing the spare parts and from the war. Keep going on, no? Yeah, we got, we got some money. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you, but I will not. Go. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, is here. So uh, Timo Fly, Timo Timo Fly, sorry. Uh, hello, okay. welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. So you are closing the, the session, really. So uh, and we'll respond to your own comments now. Uh, thank you very much. My apologies for um, you know we're, uh, we're still running here. All kinds of. Um, it's not the first time I had to disconnect because of uh, my alarm or something like that. I think we had a Twitter space with Sergey, uh, and in the middle I had to run away. Uh, so my apologies for me. So I, I wanted to uh, thank you very much uh, for you know giving time to this, uh, and thank you very much for the fantastic. Uh, presentations and um, there are a couple of points I want to make and some of them are informed by you know the reflections that some other people have been making um, one is I, I you know I want to point out a paradox uh, that there is currently in my view in the Russian society and the paradox is that the society simultaneously denies that there is a war and um, and supports it uh, and, you know, it's not everyone, it, but it's a substantive part of uh, the society. It's tens of millions of people um, who are more or less in, choose to ignore the information, but if pressed, they accept, you know, they have access to information, they understand what's going on. And they, they, they say nothing is going on if you ask them or they pretend nothing is going on and they support what's going on. And in that sense, I think in many ways, the issue that we are facing here is, uh, is um, informational too. And uh, this is a problem that we want as academics to understand better. And our thinking about the war and the conflict is essentially has been economic and kinetic. You know, we have been talking about the war itself and we have been talking about the, the economic aspect of it, like embargo sanctions. And then we have been talking about um, about the possible diplomatic solutions or just diplomatic process, diplomatic political process around it. But I think uh, the, this view that the conflict or the war is in at least in three domains, diplomatic, uh, kinetic and economic is, is, uh, is, uh, needs to be expanded, I think. Uh, currently, the, the, there are two observations. I think first is that the, the war is not, a, um, is, is in many ways, everyone understands it, but it's, it's very hybrid, it's very continuous. And the frameworks to think about it, we, we, they are like, uh, they are very discreet. You know, there is a war or not. If you look at Article 5 from NATO, it's, you know, it's a very discreet, uh, there has to be a trigger and there has to be an agreement to trigger it. And so I, I think that that's a bit outdated. And similarly with the domains, you know, if we look at the domains, the domains, in my view, are uh, much larger or much more numerous. Look at international institutions. In many of the international institutions, let's say um, the United uh, Nations Security Forum uh, uh, Council, or many of the IFIs, um, Russia is 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 uh, has a veto power or strong procedural. Uh, mechanisms and they're using it as a, as a um, as a mechanism to advance their objectives and they're not acting there in good faith. So essentially, they are sabotaging the very institutions which were designed to prevent conflicts or to resolve conflicts. So the Russia has learned to do that, um, and they are holding up essentially. They are not Russia hold up or any other country hold up proof now. Uh, another example is you 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 know in cyber. We have talked about cyber. Uh, quite a bit, but it's a serious domain in which Russia has been unable to 
claim space in any way. This is the area in which against Ukraine, they have been, you know, they have very limited uh, success. And in fact, I think Ukraine is counterattacking in cyber quite, uh, quite uh, successfully. Then there is info sharing. Here's an example of WHO. WHO currently is upset with uh, the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian government has refused to give information to WHO, but that's because Russia has access to the information from WHO for just, you know, as, as a membership uh, practice. And so the information about the number of wounded at the hospitals, their location, all that information is actually valuable in the, in the, in the hot, you know, in, in the actual war and WHO has to give this information to Russia. So there is information sharing through the international institutions uh, and essentially they are forcing uh, either, you know, you know, Russia or Ukraine to be excluded from these institutions. Then there is info wars, informational wars, and something very interesting is happening. So what Russia is doing, Russia is blocking access to Western information in Russia, but at the same time continues to broadcast, let's say through Twitter or through Facebook, uh, through the very uh, social networks that they ban themselves domestically, they continue to broadcast to the West. And um, they're quite um, successful in, um, you know, uh, in, in, in affecting people who are critical thinkers. So, you know, we're used to propaganda and we're talking about propaganda, but there are a lot of critical thinkers and, and what Russia does, they, they plan doubt in, in people's minds um, and, um, and make it quite abstract. Um, and I think uh, what I've learned it, during this war personally, as an academic, that certain things you have to experience you cannot study them. I, you know, it's it just they're too abstract to study. And, and until I have been bombed, you know, and Kiev has been bombed, and I woke, I woke up to the sounds of missiles around me, it was very difficult for me to kind of, uh, you know, be, uh, kind of understand certain aspects of it. You know, I'm not going to go in details of this, but I think uh, there is the issue that uh, Russia is very good at questioning the specific facts and. Uh, making the war abstract for uh, European and, uh, you know, international audiences. And that, of course, makes sanctions or at least pressure on sanctions less effective. Finally, there are three domains in, um, in economic warfare. And we have been talking about one, the energy. But there are two more. One is food security. The other one is logistics. Some of North China trade is going through Central Europe anyway, through railroads. And destabilization there would lead to destabilization of that logistics and Russia will be able to have quite a bit of influence. Now, if uh, planting season is disrupted in Ukraine, Russia will have quite a bit of uh, leverage in uh, middle, some Middle Eastern countries, North, Amer uh, North African countries, and some of the Asian countries in terms of uh, securing food or disrupting food supplies. And uh, that means they will have an additional tool for political instability. So, so I think the, the, the war or the conflict has become much more expanded and the, the, the number of domains has become much more, much larger, much, much more numerous. And at the same time, the existing frameworks are sort of very discreet and they are not uh, adequate to cope with this uh, continuous escalation. Um, so I think we, we have to rethink both the security framework and the domains and understand that these are domains, they're all connected. Um, thank you. So we have questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so th there's the right? okay, th there were uh, two questions for Yuri, actually. Uh, one in the... Uh, to the game theoretical question in a way. So could we say that nuclear deterrence should make it easier, not more difficult, for two countries to engage in conventional conflict in a third country because of deterrence? The reasoning is the following. The two countries can credibly commit not to endanger the existence of the opponent and limit their engagement to the third country. Uh, so this, of, go of course, goes completely against the common view that uh, any US-Russia direct engagement would automatically escalate to nuclear conflict. So that's one uh, one question by Mark Ferber on, on this uh, kind of twist on uh, uh, what uh, Yuri has talked about. And the other question is about the, the notion of crazy type, uh, which we know from game theory, but uh, concretely, what does it mean really in terms of the, the psychology of, of Putin? Uh, in, you know, can we say a bit more about uh, what a crazy type is uh, from a psychiatric point of view, uh, almost? 
that's the two questions more. Okay, I should say I should say I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know how this works. Um, if somebody is interested in learning more about this, there is a wonderful movie called Doctor Strange Love, where you look at the psychology of what happens in, in the standoff. Um, I should mention that there are historical precedents when more committed people were, you know, seriously running for political office. Barry uh, Goldwater was one example. Uh, Ronald Reagan was another example. Um, I don't want to name any current politicians, but imagine if Donald Trump was the president of the United States today, it, would he be, you know, the right person in the right time? I'm, I'm not sure, but this would be one example of, you know, somebody who is less uh, committed to not using uh, nuclear weapons, probably. I don't know. Um, I'm speculating now. Um, so, as I said, <clears throat> In my response in the chat, uh, once somebody is threatening to use nuclear weapons, you have very few pleasant options. You have to think very, very hard about very bad scenarios. And unfortunately, we're in this situation when we have to think about this very bad scenarios. I'll stop here. So we have, um, we can take uh, a few more questions. Uh, Perhaps we could ask you a question too uh, on your, I mean, your presentation about the inequality of wealth in Russia, which are quite outstanding. The, the, the number of people in the top 0.1 person, that was 10,000, that sounded like a lot to me. There are so many guys uh, who are the oligarchs. Uh, I thought it would be like 100. Uh, yes, but so who are they somehow? Well, like, um, that's a very hard question, but I, I think. Like we hear, hear a lot about the oligarchs, and I feel like the journalists, they, they, they do a very good job to really name a person yeah. and, and tell the story of how they uh, got wealthy and um, how, how they might have gotten wealthy, maybe um, not always in, in a fair way, and how they hide their wealth. Um, but maybe let me say you're so the Russian, um, we look at the Russian adult population, and the Russian adult population is about 100 million. So the 0.01 percent is about 10,000 people. And the question is, if we want to have targeted sanctions more at the more powerful people, um, the the European Union um, has now sanctions on about um, several hundred people. I think it's 800 people and then other entities. Um, but then we could think about: Is this enough to to really capture the powerful elite around Putin? Is that enough to put pressure? Or should we go for the, the top 0.01% uh, for the top 10,000 um, and, and, and put more pressure? But the, the solution for both or in both scenarios, I, I think we could put more pressure definitely if we put sanctions on, on, on more people there. Um, but, but the main problem in both scenarios is that, okay, we see that a yacht was seized here and we see that um, some bank accounts um, might have been frozen or were at least detected, but we, a large part of the wealth, no matter if we talk about 800 people or 10,000, we just don't see because they're for some channels through shell companies that are incorporated in the tax haven. And then uh, this shell company buys real estate in a European member state. And then we don't know the beneficial owner in such a concept. So, yeah, so first I, I apologize. I realized that I asked a stupid question. Top zero one person must be 10,000. <laughs> for the 12th person of wealth, you would, you would expect that uh, it would be a, a lower number. Uh, that maybe the question should have been uh, what is the share which is held by the top 1,000? I spoke about that in the past. Yes, and, uh, what it could mean out of this 12th person. So that should, that should have been my proper way of asking the question. So, but it just was a stupid, uh, stupid way. But um, like top hundred people is a quarter of the top. Okay. Top hundred people holds uh, four hundred or four five hundred billion dollars. The total household wealth is like two, two trillion dollars. So okay. Top hundred people really matters. Two hundred really matters. One hundred. So one top hundred people. Top hundred people really is really what matters. So exactly. So that's what kind of question. So and so then uh, so what do you mean? A top person matters more than top hundred. 
the, the top number one person matters more than the next 1990. Yes, sir. <laughs> for, for many reasons. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, the gas uh, embargo. So uh, on the one hand, I, I am read, I'm reading with the great interest uh, those uh, calculations made for Germany. I was already thinking how exactly to um, modify them and, and try to come up with, uh, with numbers for, for the case of Italy, like, uh, like it was asked in one of the questions. So that's the natural thing to do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm uh, in line with what I was saying that, uh, in my view, we should do exactly the opposite of what, uh, of what we are doing right now. So we should be very tough right now, go for embargo on gas right now, but with the idea that in the long run, we can uh, lift some sanctions and reestablish trade. And, and I think Sergei was very convincing in my, in my um, mind about some type of sanctions being very hard to repeal or to readjust. But actually, uh, um, in a sense, uh, the gas thing is like, you know, you, you are closing and or opening uh, one button. You know, so it, it can be done with one button, right? You go to Nord Stream 1, you close it, you reopen it. So what I'm saying is that paradoxically, even though it's the hardest thing to, uh, for our economy, uh, in the short run, but it's the most effective. But it could also be uh, one that could be repealed most easily and, uh, uh, if the ceasefire and, uh, and the proper signing of a peace treaty is, uh, uh, is, is uh, signed. And so I'm thinking, you know, how, how uh, uh, much should we think about those numbers as yearly, you know, losses in growth, et cetera, if, if we have a, a policy that uh, that says you know uh, uh, if you if you have if we have peace by November fifteen we can we can reopen the bottle. Uh, Timo, if you wanted to to say a word, okay, I'll get back to you. Yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, thank you. Uh, I would. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, my point on sanction is that the problem is not the economic aspect and or not even the. Uh, incentives it might create for Russia, let alone the question whether Russia responds to incentives, uh, given that we are not necessarily clear about what the objectives are. Uh, I think the issue is that we are facing political difficulties implementing sanctions. So in whatever design is that we're discussing has to take into account that uh, mm -hmm. this is about political strategic communication. Yes. Both Russia and uh, we, you know, the West or the democratic world, the free world, is communicating with our voters and to an extent with, with Russians about what is happening really in the theater of war. And in that sense, gradual sanctions, which respond to yet another episode of atrocities, do uh, you know might be better at communicating and keeping attention focused on what's actually happening in terms of facts rather than uh just one time sanction and some incentive so we might win if we have a you know very clear incentive design of the sanctions we might win the incentive logic but we will lose in the political support because russia might capture the narrative so it's as well the war about the initiative in the sanction and in the kinetic war theater as it is in the communication. So whoever controls the narrative might have more success at stopping the war. And the U.S. was fascinatingly good before the war at controlling the narrative. And Zelensky was fantastic at controlling the narrative after the war started. Because the first time, at least in, my, in, in what I observed, is that Russia has not been able to control, at least substantively confuse the narrative. No one is talking about the civil war, or Russian versus Ukrainian language, or that uh, no one attacked Crimea. Uh, it just was, uh, you know, some kind of coup in Kiev and something else. You know, that all is gone. Uh, so communication is as important for our ability to actually act 
in response to right to and engage our existing institutions because in existing institutions response to the political pressure from the voters and if the voters are confused then there is a problem with that and Russia is confusing European voters so the sanctions are a part of communication strategy too mm -hmm. okay. this is very important so you so you you do somehow this is what the, the West has in mind somehow to, to, to keep some leeway for future sanctions. Uh, and you are in your adding it's not just a tit for tap it's also a way of making it sure that within uh, there is an understanding of the of the deterioration of the situation exactly so this is a communication strategy where uh, the us or the eu says listen that was bad in bucha and then the russian population has to respond to that and that's a message to the russian population that bucha was serious as opposed to something else otherwise bucha would have been buried And the same is domestically, that Russia, if you look at their uh, Twitter, if they look at their Facebook, at all the media, they're basically downplaying the scale of everything. They're saying it's not a big deal. Maybe it was staged, you know, put the, you know maybe it's a different story here and there, uh, put uh, the, the Western media on defensive. They have to demonstrate that actually uh, there is satellite images, that the bodies were two weeks in advance, that it's really, you know, now we're starting to defend ourselves. And that's all needed to uh, polarize some of the, Uh, population in the West. And so I think uh, sanctions connected to specific incidents happening uh -huh. in the theater of war is more about communication and managing attention of both populations in Russia and outside of Russia, rather than about incentives for... Uh, it's as much as war of the opinions or the control, the battle for the population, for the opinion of the public, as it is a kinetic warfare. Uh, on, on communication, even though I, I believe that the value of the embargo is, is pure, purely economic, uh, but the, the rhetoric thing uh, as, is, is very important, as you say, I agree. Uh, but, it also, but sometimes uh, one, uh, when being uh, super successful in, in it, like Zelensky has been, runs also some risks. So for example, by saying at the, at the Italian parliament, that uh, in, a, in a very uh, you know, successful way with all, all applause, et cetera, that the people are uh, the Ukrainian army. The people of Ukraine are the Ukrainian army. This is actually something that could backfire when coming to, uh, to talk about Bucha, because at that point, the, 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 with that statement, the, there has been a blurring of what is the military and what is the civilian. This is a risk. Okay. So just one word. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, there's yes, a very yes, interesting yes, aspect yes. for you. About, but I think there's one big danger with any gradualism, which is that it creates a massive fallout problem. So we don't adjust now because we hope that at some point this goes away. Maybe the oil sanctions, the gas sanctions are never coming. And then industry doesn't adjust, households don't adjust, and then come fall. Putin is 10 times more powerful than he is now. And I think that logic on the Western side is very, very dangerous. That's exactly the game that people are playing, saying, like, oh, we don't know if this is coming, we don't adjust. But the, the, the small costs that we have in these models, they only apply when you really start the adjustment now. Um, so delaying can be very, very costly for us. It goes both ways, of course. And it's a high price to pay for some communication clarity, in my view. But I mean, it's an interesting point. Yeah, but it's not you were saying with the opposite, so it's interesting to, to listen to what you were saying. And it's important that you can graduate your answer and say, it's not, we, we go all the way towards all full sanctions today, and somehow you can do whatever you want afterwards, but to be able to respond uh, systematically to any... any but, but it's a different from what, I think it's, it's a different argument from what you are saying. But... but You can, you, you can, yeah, sorry. So, sorry, I just want to say that there is no, uh, so the way at least I view subjectively, there's no conflict. Mm -hmm. I wish the sanctions were introduced after Crimea or even better after the Georgian war. So of course, delaying this sends the wrong signal to the economy in terms of adjustment and so on. Ukraine has not started adjusting its dependence on the Russian gas until Crimea was taken. So there is absolutely clear there is a commitment and hold up problem. Obviously, they have to be addressed. But that doesn't exclude the aspect that we need to be managing attention, at least not forgetting that we're truly in the battle of confusion over all facts and erosion of trust, that things 
which normally would have been accepted by, by everyone as a fact, are being challenged daily in a systematic way by a well-established network and ecosystem of Russian apparatus. And we have to find a way to resist that. And so that one way of this is connecting actions with the facts. And so when, a, when President Biden or you know, anyone, a top politician comes out and says, we introduce sanctions and they are painful because of something else which happened on the ground, that's control of attention. I'm not saying it's done in the optimal way. I'm just saying that you cannot do it zero one and ignore it, right? You live, the moment you live vacuum. So basically the way, you know, I've worked in the government now, I was, you know, in the cabinet. So I know how info ops are done from inside, you know, against Ukraine or Ukrainian info ops. The way you do it, you find a way where there is lack of context. You need to collapse the context. And when, you know, when you're talking to European population, they don't have a context of Bucha. They don't understand, you know, they don't know Bucha. They don't know, they understand the details. The moment you have collapse of context, you can manage public opinion. And that's what Russia is very good at, at collapsing the context. They're saying, what about, what about, what about? And then people are lost. So uh, what uh, the, Zelensky was doing quite well, not without mistakes, I admit that. And also Biden in the beginning, before the war, they were controlling the narrative. So they are f- focusing their attention. Uh, and Russia had difficult time resisting the, you know, using the techniques of diverting attention. I'm just saying that this should be connected in the, when we're talking about design of sanctions, we should not overlook design of uh, attention management. Mm-hmm. Sergey, you want to say something? No, sure you want. I think uh, I can only wish that the war finishes and uh, both places become peaceful and prosperous countries. Okay, well, this is uh, full lack of words. Uh, uh, is there any other questions? No, we are all good. Well, thank you all. I think we've learned. Thank you very uh, much, all, all of you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Good luck. Uh, we are all with you. And uh, thank you, Ilan, for organizing uh, this panel. Really, it was fascinating. Uh, so, after all, economics have a lot to say about this, these questions, right? And we hope we can you know, keep going on. And, 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 and very nice to hear the voice of Timothy again after so long and in such an important and terrible moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we all stand.